As you know, I've been speaking in the last few, actually five weeks now, I've been speaking to you about the grace of God. And one of the main things I said last week is that grace is God's best gift to us. And as a consequence of that, grace is the best gift that we have to offer the world in God's stead as a consequence of our being in relationship with God. As Gordon MacDonald wrote, the world does almost everything as well or much better than the church, but it does not and cannot offer grace. We can. We can. And again, let me remind you why we can. Here it is. Grace is all, everything, that God is now free to do for us because of what Jesus accomplished in our behalf upon the cross. And so the truth is, apart from the cross of Jesus Christ, we would not have access to God's grace. Which means then there are important reasons and issues of justice that make the cross of Jesus Christ necessary for our salvation. And that's why you have Paul the Apostle saying this as a part of his testimony. He said, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why would he say such a thing? Well, I want you to see why here in Romans chapter 3. I'm going to walk you through some very valuable truth that speaks to us of the issue of the cross. We're going to see two things. What the cross means to us and then what the cross means to God. So let's read verse 21 through 23. Paul writes, but now, apart from the law, he means by that, apart from religious rule keeping, the righteousness of God has been manifested or revealed or made known. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Notice that again. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think we should ask the question, what does it mean to fall short of the glory of God? And I would add quickly, it this doesn't mean that somehow you and I are supposed to be as glorious as God is, and we have failed to achieve that, and that's the problem. That isn't the issue at all. Actually, I think the best approach to understand this is based on what the Apostle Paul is teaching in the book of Romans, chapter 1, starting with verse 18. Look at this, please. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, the word suppress there is very interesting. It means literally to push down and away. Um, I've used the illustration before of someone who has a beach ball and they're in the water and they're trying to hold that ball underwater. It takes effort to do that. And it, 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 you feel the pushback. There's tension. That's the word. The Greek word for suppress is the word that you would use to describe the effort of someone trying to hold that beach ball under the water. And so Paul is saying the wrath of God is revealed, literally being revealed because of the present tense. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against people 
who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now in Romans 1, as this continues, here's what people do to suppress truth. Notice they exchange the glory of the incorruptible God. The word exchange in Greek means they trade in. Or they trade away the glory of God. They trade away the glory of God for something else. Look at verse 25. He says here, they exchange, same, same word, the truth of God for a lie. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. And then in verse 28, here's where things ultimately end up for people. Paul says, they do not see fit to acknowledge God any longer. And so here's what he's talking about. It's the idea that there are people who don't want to think of God on his terms. And as a result of that, they either ignore him or they might try to redefine him according to their taste, in, according to their liking. See also people like Oprah Winfrey and many others who are trying to redefine who God is and what he's like. That's what he's talking about here. Or there are people who will push God out to the periphery of their life and then they simply tune him out or they refuse to listen to him. As a result of this choice, God goes, listen, God goes unacknowledged, untrusted, and unvalued. Unvalued. And what Romans 3.23 is saying, really, is that all of us are guilty of this that Paul is discussing. All of us at one time or another, to one degree or another, we have failed to embrace the glory of God. We have traded away what God offers us in glory. We have traded it for something else. Or perhaps to crystallize this even more, this is my view, my definitions. Romans 3.23, all have sinned. What does that mean? Well, here's a summary. Sin is essentially the idea of rejecting God and His glory as the all-important virtue, as the supreme value in our lives. Or, how about this? Sin considers God in all of His glory. And where, where do you see God in His glory? In nature? In the universe? in Scripture, on every page, in the person of Jesus Christ. Sin considers God in all of His glory, in all of these ways, but then very foolishly turns away from Him to embrace something else that doesn't remotely begin to compare with His value. You see, sin is not so much attacking God or being angry with God or attempting to belittle Him or hating Him. It's not so much hurling accusations at Him. It's simply not wanting Him. It's not loving Him as supreme in our lives. It has to do with trading God away for something else. Trading God away for career. Trading God away for money, for material things. Trading Him away for the glory of sex. Rejecting His glory for some other consideration. For human glory. And of course, as a result of people like us making those kinds of decisions day in and day out, God ends up being devalued, diminished, pressed down. God ends up being belittled. I mean, think of that. Whenever I am confronted with the glory of this incorruptible God, and yet I turn away for, from Him for some other 
so-called glory, the message that I'm sending to the world and to everyone around me is that God isn't glorious enough for me. God isn't supreme enough for me. And I am devaluing and demeaning God before the eyes of the world. And we've all done it. All, all have sinned and fall short. Now, once again, back in Romans 1.18, Paul says that against sin and against those who suppress the truth in righteousness, he says the wrath of God is being revealed. The wrath of Almighty God. Think of it this way, if you would. The wrath, the fury, the rage, the anger, the justice, the condemnation of God is against those who suppress the truth. I wonder if you realize this morning this is the biggest problem we all have in this thing called human life or ever will have. And it's a problem, folks, that demands an answer and a solution. Otherwise, without a solution to this problem, without an answer to this problem, we will never have forgiveness of our sins. We will never have a relationship with God. And we will never, ever make heaven our home. That's why it's easy, easily, this issue is easily the most important, the most serious, the most overwhelming problem in all of human life. In fact, this problem is more serious than cancer. It's more serious than being lonely. It's more serious than not having a job. It's more serious than being broke. <clears throat> It's more serious than having a bad heart. And here's the thing. On a human level, there is no solution to be found. There is no answer. The only solution is that God in heaven might be merciful toward us and act in our behalf to deliver us. And that is what he did for us 2,000 years ago when he gave his son to die in our stead upon the cross. In fact, this is the good news of Romans 3, 24. Verse 23, all have sinned, they fall short of the glory of God. And then in the next verse, verse 24, this verse explains what the cross means to us. Paul says, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, by the way, back two verses, verse 21, it says there, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested or revealed or made available is the idea. And so in verse 24, this is what he means. This is the way the, the righteousness of God is made available to people like us. Four things. Four things. The first is in the phrase, being justified. Being justified. By the way, you can see here, the verb is passive. Not only in English, but in Greek. It's a passive verb. That means this is something that is done to us. If it was an action, active verb, it would mean that it's up to us. It, but it's not. It's passive. And so the action here belongs to someone else. Being justified means to be made right with God. And the point I want you to get is that it's all God's doing. It's all God's doing. Now, secondly, Paul says, using the next phrase, being justified as a gift. Being made right with God as a gift. Think, if you would, just for a moment about the nature of a gift. <clears throat> a, a gift is something you can receive, but you don't buy. 
You, you can only receive it. If I walk up to uh, Carmen and give him a gift all wrapped nice and I hand it to him and then I say, all right, I need 20 bucks. <laughs> well, uh, that isn't a gift, right? I'm selling him something. He has to buy something from me. A gift is, is, if you pay for it, then it ceases to be a gift. That's the point. And then look at the next three words of verse 24. Being justified as a gift by His grace. And so, this justification, this free gift of salvation is based on God's grace, which means, remember, unearned, undeserved favor. You see, mercy in the Bible, mercy means you don't get what you do deserve. Grace means you get what you don't deserve. And God is both merciful and gracious to us. Grace is the good that you get when someone owes you absolutely nothing. In fact, look at this passage on the screen. Romans 4.4, 4, Paul writes, when people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they have earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith, their trust in God who forgives sinners. Now, one more point in verse 24. This really is the key that unlocks all of this for us. Notice, it's through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Being justified as a gift by His grace all those layers of truth and what he's talking about, how is this made available? Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And all of, in other words, all of this good comes to us through the redemption, which of course is pointing us where? To the cross of Jesus Christ, where he paid for our sins. Redemption, by the way, um, Leon Morse, a New Testament scholar, talks about the meaning of redemption, he writes, it means deliverance at a cost or release by the payment of a price. And so for us, this idea of our redemption means simply that we gain a deliverance, we gain a release from all the charges that are against us. And there are many against you and against me. We gain a deliverance from all of the charges that are against us. We are set free by the payment of a price. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I wonder if you've ever considered the fact that a ransom has been paid for you. A price has been paid for your soul. Jesus said in Mark 10, 45, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom, a payment for many, for many. Look at this, 1 Peter 1, 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. A ransom has been paid for your soul. This is what the cross means to you. Your sin debt was paid at the cross. The wrath of God that is against you because of your sinfulness, that wrath of God was dealt with at the cross. And let me explain how that happens. This is verse 25 of Romans 3. And in verse 25 and 26, these two verses help us to understand what the cross means to God. 
You see, there is a sense in which I can say Jesus Christ died for me. But have you, have you ever understood the fact that Jesus Christ also died for God? Yes, he died for me. He also died for God. That might sound strange, but let me explain. Look at this verse. Paul says of Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his or God's righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. This verse right here is the divine side of the cross. It shows us what the cross means to God. For example, Paul says that God displays Jesus publicly. What he means is the cross was a very public event. Everyone in Jerusalem knew that the Nazarene from Nazareth was being put to death. There were hundreds and thousands and thousands of people in Jerusalem, and this was the center event in everyone's life. They all knew what was taking place when that morning and that afternoon unfolded the first Good Friday. They all knew it was a public display event. That's his point. Then he says, and please watch this, this is to demonstrate God's righteousness, or you could say, this is to vindicate God's righteousness. Now here's the question, why does God, why does God need to show the world that he is righteous? And in what sense does God need vindication? Well, there is a sense in which God has a bit of an appearance problem. And what causes this appearance problem is a little phrase in verse 25. Notice in verse 25, I have it darkened, that God in his forbearance passed over sins that were previously committed. Now, what he means here is for centuries and centuries, God was very aware of the sin of men and women. He knew everything that was taking place. He knew the choices of men and women like us, yet he didn't judge. He didn't pour out his wrath. He didn't punish. He didn't pour out his wrath in justice. Or think of this, if you would. In 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12, you have the story of David. David was king of Israel, had everything working in his favor. He was in a great place in his life. And in arrogance, he fell into an adulterous relationship with Bathsheba. She became pregnant. In order to cover his tracks, he arranged for her husband, Uriah, who was a great warrior, a very noble, honorable man. David had Uriah put in a place in battle where the likelihood of his being killed was very high. And that's exactly what happened. Uriah was dead. David took Bathsheba into his home. It all looked very noble on his part. But here's the issue. All of what David did was known of God. All things are naked and open before him of whom we have to do. That's Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. And it's true. God is omniscient. We can't hide anything from God. He knew of David's sin. Here's what he does. He sends a man a prophet by the name of Nathan to confront David in his sin. And when David is confronted, I give him this credit, he instantly, immediately owned everything and repented of his sin. And then Nathan says to David, listen to this. He said to David, and the Lord has put away your sin. You will not die. 
And so just like that, murder and adultery is passed over. Just like that. God's powerful judgment and wrath does not fall on David. To use the language of this verse, instead of instant judgment, God passes over these sins. Now, needless to say, to some people, this would suggest that sin really must not be that bad. God must not be that holy, and sin must not be that bad. People might conclude that. However, if you were, if you were Bathsheba's dad and mom, and this happened to your daughter, or even more, if this, if you were Uriah's dad, and your son was the apple of your eye, and he was treated like this, and you found out about it, how would you feel? If that's your flesh and blood, you feel a sense of outrage. How in the world can God do this? This is injustice. What would happen today if some judge in Pennsylvania would hear a case like David and just let him go? Bill O'Reilly would be talking about it for a month. <laughs> and rightly so. Now, on the other hand, here's what we have to understand, folks, and it's this. God didn't let David off the hook, just like God didn't let you off the hook, and God didn't let me off the hook. And that's because on that very public cross, all of the sins of David, all of your sins, all of my sins, on that public cross were placed upon the person of Jesus Christ and the wrath of God that I deserve, that you deserve, that David deserves fell on our substitute instead of us. Romans, or excuse me, Isaiah 53 says of Jesus, he was pierced through for our transgressions. Notice the personal pronouns. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. Scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to His own way. Watch the language. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on Him. When this took place, it is described in Scripture as the propitiation of our sins. Jesus is our wrath bearer. All of the vengeance and hatred and wrath and justice that God had towards sin was put on Jesus. Do you know what that says? It makes such a strong statement because it actually means that God will judge sin wherever He finds it, even if it's on His only begotten Son. That's how serious God is about His justice, about His holiness, and about His need of vindication. And on the cross, Jesus vindicates the honor of God which is what the next verse is all about. This means, Paul says, the very public execution of Jesus Christ was a demonstration of His righteousness, meaning God's righteousness or God's rightness at the present time, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, folks, the essence of the Christian gospel and, and message, what makes Christianity unique and different from every other religion on this planet, what makes it so different is this. Righteousness and justification is not man's gift to God. It's God's gift to man if you will have it. 
if you will have it, if you will trust. Look at this by Dr. Ray Ortland. He says this, God presented Jesus as a propitiation by his blood. This means Jesus satisfied the wrath of God against our sins. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement. Atonement is a word that means at one meet. At one meet. You have two people, let's say, who are at odds, and you bring them to meet together in reconciliation. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement, a propitiation to satisfy his justice. That's what propitiation means. It's as if the death of Jesus writes the scales in God's moral reckoning. The question is, will we trust him for the value of what he offers us in Christ. By the way, <clears throat> I have found that trusting in Jesus Christ is at one and the same time both the hardest and at the same time the easiest thing for us to do. It's hard because of one issue, human pride. We don't like to admit wrong. Have you ever noticed when anyone accuses you of wrongdoing? What do you feel impulsively, instinctively? You want to defend yourself. You, you just instinctively do that. We all do that. That's pride. That's pride that, that resists God speaking to us and, and working in our life. We don't want to admit that we have that need. We don't want to admit because people may look at us differently, our friends, and, and our pride doesn't want to allow that to take place in our life. It's the easiest thing to do, the hardest thing to do, but at the same time, the easiest thing to do. Because really, what God is asking you is this. Take the kind of faith you put in automobiles and airplanes and doctors. Take the kind of faith you put in red lights. The kind of faith that you... Uh, put in all types of things through the course of your week in life. Take that kind of faith and put it in the person of Jesus Christ and rely upon him, trust him. That's the easiest thing in the world to do. So easy, a small child can do it. It's so easy that even someone with an extremely low IQ, I have known of people in my lifetime who cannot read, who cannot write. I know this because they're my uncles, two of them. And I know this, that a person who can't read or write, who can't uh, think on a very high level, that person can put trust in Jesus Christ. A baby, a child. There are people in this room, I would bet, who receive the Lord as their Savior when they were just seven, eight years old, perhaps. A child can do it. And you can do it because it's the easiest thing to do. Now I have one closing question and it's this. If you're a Christian here today and Jesus Christ has paid your sin debt and he has given to you the gift of eternal salvation, then what kind of value should we be placing on him? Should he not be the boast of our life? Should he not be the supreme value of our life if he has done that for us? You might be thinking, why has God chosen to work in the way that he has? I have an answer to that, and it's this. <clears throat> On the cross, the Father in heaven treated Jesus as if he were you so that he might treat you now as if you were Jesus. And he will if you will trust in Christ alone as your Savior, Savior from all sin. But why is he chosen to work in this way? 1 Corinthians 1.27 God chose the things the world considers foolish 
in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and God used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. It's pretty clear, isn't it? God is against human boasting. And the simple reason why he's against it is because human boasting is always based on an illusion. The illusion being that I am something apart from God and his grace. And the truth is we need him for the next breath that we take. God is against human boasting. But if people understand the finished work, the cross of Christ, the one thing you can't stop them from doing is boasting in the Lord Jesus. I'm hoping that's you. I'm hoping that's this church. Let's pray.